Hey everyone, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for the following week of May 2015, the week that you see in the title. Uh, this is way, way late, but better late than never. Is Things got busy around here. We had a lot of company, I had a busy weekend, and not to mention I got a job and I got a lot of work to do and I have a life outside of that job and a life outside of YouTube but I found the time to come over here and shoot my mouth off for you and uh, for those of you who've been asking me to do a free comic book day video I am gonna do one okay I just don't know when I'm gonna do it I got a stash for free comic book day and I need to read those books I haven't even read my free comic book day books yet and I just got some free comic book day books in the mail from my bro Chris, the Mount Vernon kid. And I gotta read those. Once I get those read, I will come on here and talk about them. Trust me. I'm not ignoring your request to do a free comic book day video. I just need to read the books before I review them. Okay? It would, I would look really stupid if I reviewed a book without reading it first. Uh, but trust me, I, I'm, there will be one. Okay? Just... Just give me time. There will be one. I promise. Uh, and also, before I start here, I need to show y'all this. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 45. I reviewed this this book in another, in another video. And if you haven't seen it yet, go check it out on my Blue Goblin X channel. That's where it'll be. You're going to want to hear what I have to say about that book. Trust me. I got some stuff. Uh, got quite a pile of books here. Okay. So I'm going to try to rush through this as quickly as I possibly can, okay? I got Dynamite, Marvel, and DC. Keyword, try to rush through it. We're going to start with Dynamite. We're going to start with issue one of Swords of Sorrow. Uh, Gail Simone, Sergio Davila. Uh, de This is a testament to how good a writer Gail Simone really is and why she's one of my favorite writers. She got me to jump on board with this. Normally I would just buy this book for Red Sonja, but Red Sonja does not get most of the spotlight in this book. You got the other two supporting characters, Vampirella and I forgot who she is. Uh, but this right here was a really good introductory issue to this storyline. What this did, what this is, is your is your your standard introductory issue that introduces all the characters. For those readers who probably don't know who they are, or probably don't know that much about them, so I think this is new reader friendly. I think it, I really think it is. And storytelling in here was really good. The interior artwork was also really good, and I fucking love this cover. This is a cover I wanted. Um. Yeah, the J. Scott Campbell art uh, cover was was good, but I liked this one better. But solid job, great writing, great artwork, just really good stuff. We're using this. This is the issue that's introducing all the characters and getting them all built up to when they eventually, you know, when they eventually begin the team up. Really good, solid. I enjoyed it. Three point five. Go to Marvel. Oh boy. Starting off with Amazing Spider-Man number 718. And for those of you who want me to quit complaining about the issue number, sorry, ain't gonna happen. Because in my opinion, this is number 718. You don't like it? You don't have to watch my videos. Just saying. But yeah, Parker Industries, no more. Um. Look, Spider-Man may, may be my favorite superhero of all time. Everybody knows that about me. But that doesn't mean he's without faults. What the hell was this? What this basically was, was Dan Slott and Christos Gage basically telling me that Peter Parker would completely and utterly fucking suck as the CEO of any company. And don't even get me started on that bullshit speech at the end of the story. It's like, a corporation doesn't need a building. A corporation is us. Us people working together as a team. I'm like, what is this? Are you fucking coaching a football team? No! 
That's not how you talk business. A business, a corporation needs a headquarters to operate their fucking business. This is not the goddamn high school varsity football team. This is a fucking corporation. What the hell was this? And using an Iron Man villain, the, the fucking ghost, and um, what the hell? This first story was garbage. It was fucking garbage. And the second story with Black Cat, fuck you, Marvel, for what you did to the Black Cat. It's like she went completely fucking insane. What? Because Doc Ock punched her in the face and Peter's too goddamn stupid to try and talk to her. Or she's too goddamn stupid to slow down and try to fucking listen to him. This issue was crap. It was crap. Let's give it a two. Fuck that book. Moving on to... Spider Gwen, number four, Jason Latour and Rodriguez. Good job. This was good. Really good. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. It's just, this right here was heavy, 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 heavy on the drama. You know, especially with, you know, Gwen talking with Uncle Uncle Ben and Aunt May. Remember, this takes place in an alternate reality. She's talking with Aunt May and Uncle Ben about Peter and what kind of a what kind of boy Peter was before he died, you know, and stuff like that. That was the main selling point of the story. It was good. It was really good. You know, Gwen still cannot get over Peter's death. It's still the one thing that haunts her. Gee, does that sound familiar? Uh, but it's something that constantly haunts her. And you could really tell by the artwork with the body language and the facial expressions and the way the dialogue was presented that it took a lot of courage for Gwen to even sit down and talk with May about how she really felt about Peter, you know, stuff like that. It's just really, really good storytelling, really good dialogue, really good writing, solid artwork to match it. Good stuff all around. This was a this was a great read. I really enjoyed this. I give this a four. Don't hate me. I just love to be brutally honest sometimes, okay? Secret Wars, number one, here it is. Jonathan Hickman. As soon as I knew that Jonathan Hickman was writing this story, I knew before I even started reading the fucking book that the Fantastic Four was going to be the main focuses of this first fucking issue. I knew it. I knew it before I even opened the book or seen any preview of the book or anything like that. I knew the Fantastic Four was going to be one of the main focuses. I knew it. And big surprise, this book fucking bored me. It really did. And that really hurts. It really hurts to say it. But this book bored me. Doesn't mean the whole book was bad. There were some decent moments in here. But it takes more than just decent moments to make a good book. Not to mention the fact this book was five fucking bucks. And I was bored. It actually took me damn near an hour to sit, get through this book. I'm telling you the truth. And the big shocking moment at the end of the book, spoiler alert, they, they went ahead and just went ahead and did it. The Marvel Universe and the Ultimate Universe gone. R.I.P. Marvel Universe 1961 to 2015. Ultimate Universe 2000 to 2015. They're gone. It's done. It's all. They're already dead and finished until we reread Battle World or something like that. This book wasn't terrible. 
I've read a lot worse shit than this. But man, this really disappointed me. One issue in, and I'm already bored off my ass. I am going to get this story though. Because if anything else, if anything, this story still intrigues me. Because it still has my interest. This was a rough start. But who knows? The rest of the story may get better over time. But there, are, I've actually been looking at other people's reviews and it's still mixed. It's mixed. It's not 50-50, but there are still mixed. There are people who love it and there are people who hate it. I'm kind of in the middle. I don't hate it, but I don't love it either. The thing is, and there, I've actually heard people, I've actually read people's comments as saying, oh, Marvel's just doing what DC did four fucking years ago. Maybe. Maybe. That's not 100% certain yet, but maybe that's what they are doing. Maybe they are just wiping everything clean and starting all over again like they did 15 years ago with the Ultimate Universe. But... Let's think about this. We're only one issue in. What do we think the long term... What are we thinking this is going to do long term for Marvel? Is it going to be a complete reboot? Or are they just going to reboot some things, but not all things? Oh, and don't get me started on the whole Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows. Oh! Spider-Man's marriage is coming back for good! <laughs> Bullshit! Joe Quesada will never let that fucking happen. If, if Marvel ever wanted to get Spider-Man's marriage to come back on a permanent basis, Joe Quesada would piss in his Mary Jane panties and go, Oh, no, that ain't happening. <laughs> so don't kid yourself. That ain't fucking happening. Renew Your Vows is going to be a two-issue miniseries on what could possibly be, but ain't going to fucking happen. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Are they going to make all the characters young? Maybe. Are they going to get rid of all the married couples? As long as Joe Quesada's in charge? Probably. There's probably going to be just a whole reboot, or they're probably just going to reboot some things, but yet keep the backstories and, and characters, ironically, the same. Like when DC did it four years ago, Batman was still an orphaned billionaire who lived in Gotham City. Superman was still from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Dick Grayson was still Robin. He was still Nightwing. One of the biggest things they changed was Barbara was an oracle. The, uh, I mean, what are really going to be? What do you really think are going to be the long-term changes after this story is done? They're just gonna read number everything back to number one, because in my opinion, they don't need to. They don't need a story. They don't need a storyline like this to do that. They can just do it for the hell of it. They practically do it all the time anyway. So, I'm talking too much about this. This was, eh, at best, 2.5 average read. Moving on, going to the unbeatable Squirrel Girl number five. This was fun. This was fun. This is base. This is basically just other interpretations that could have been for Squirrel Girl. Just really, really funny shit. I'm not going to get into it too much. All I'm going to say is buy this issue. Get on board with this series. This was fun, pure, simple fun, and I fucking loved it. 3.5. We're ending Marvel with Wolverine's number 17. Yeah. Oh boy, sinister! You crafty son of a bitch! <laughs> uh, good action, good fighting. Uh, some true heroics are shown in here from 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 characters I didn't expect it to come from. Um, always, I, I'm still liking what they're doing with Mystique. Mystique is probably my favorite character in this in this series right now, but that. That ending, wow, that cliffhanger, I'm impressed. This was good, 3.5. All right, we're going on to DC. We're going to start with Convergence number five. Woo, 
yet another showcase for the Earth 2 characters. And quite possibly one major, 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 major change to the lineup. And I'm not going to ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. But what I will say is Deimos, Deimos, however you pronounce his name. Pretty badass looking. Pretty badass looking. My biggest complaint right now with the main story of Convergence is... When the fuck did Brainiac get this powerful? How the fuck is Brainiac this powerful? I don't ever recall him being this powerful before. I really don't. Because reasons. There you go. It is what it is. Um, good stuff. Really good stuff. Uh, good spotlight here for Telos as well. I liked it. Thought it was thought it was good for what it was. I give it a 3.5. Now let's get to all the convergence tie-ins and get used to. I want to take a shot every time you hear me say convergence. We're going to convergence Batgirl number two. This issue sucked. Really did. This felt really cheesy, really corny, really silly and stupid. I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't feeling anything. This issue sucked. It it was it was almost groan worthy. The dialogue in here was so bad. So teen comedy shit. Just just wasn't feeling it. They should have gotten Brian Q. Miller to write this two-issue miniseries. They really should have, because goddamn, his writing was solid when Stephanie Brown was Batgirl. Solid shit. And this was almost uh, worthy to me. It really was. Hell, this wasn't even an average read. I'd give it a two. And that was crap. Moving on to Convergence Batman and Robin number two. Um, yeah. This was alright. This wasn't any better or any worse than the first issue was. It's just Batman, Robin, and Red Hood and Scarlet from the pre-Flashpoint DC Universe just kicking a bunch of ass. And Batman and Robin hug each other at the end. That's pretty much it. I should have passed on this on this one. On this on this two issue series. I really should have. Because I read both issues and I'm like, eh. Eh, 2.5. Alright, going to Convergence Justice League number two. The biggest thing this two issue series told me was that New 52 Mira. I like her a hell of a lot more than I like pre-Flashpoint Mira. Pre-Flashpoint Mira in this issue looked like, uh, came off a bit like your stock cliche damsel in distress. And that really bothered me. Because you see Mira in here, and you look back at Mira in the new 5-2 universe, that's what I call it, the NU-5-2. I call that I call the New 52 universe New 5-2. So when you look at Mira in New 5-2 and you compare it to Mira in here, I love Mira from New 5-2 a hell of a lot better. But the Justice League lineup that we get in here does they do work well together. They did have good chemistry. Some of the dialogue was a bit eh at times. But they really showed their own against Flashpoint Aquaman in here. Now, as stock cliched as Mera was done in here she does have a good moment in here but I'm not going to ruin what it was this was really good and it was good to see some of these characters again like you know some of these characters from the prior universe like Zatanna how she really is Jesse Quick Supergirl and of course Jade this was good this was good for what it was I liked it I give it a 3.5 <laughs> Convergence Harley Quinn number two. I don't think Jennifer's read this issue yet. And, uh, I'm probably going to let her read it right after I get done with this video. 
but this is Harley Quinn versus Captain Carrot. Enough said. This was awesome. Awesomely fun. It, it just felt, it kind of feels like the current Harley Quinn series. It felt just as fun. It was really good. You know, Captain Carrot just came off so naive in this issue with Harley constantly lying her ass off to him about what her powers are and everything. She was like doing Street Fighter movies like Fireball and stuff. And Carrot was buying it for a second. <laughs> it's like, you have the power of awesome portation? <laughs> this was good. This was good. I fucking loved it. I give it a 3.5. <sighs> Convergence, Nightwing, and Oracle number two. Gail Simone. Fuck yeah. This was good. This was really good. Uh, it's nice to see... Nightwing and Oracle working together as a team even though they constantly get on each other's damn nerves sometimes. I loved the action here. Oracle shined. I mean, Gale, I love you. I love you, Gale, because you reminded me just how awesome Barbara was as Oracle. Fuck yeah, she shined in here. Just because she can't use her legs doesn't mean she can't kick your ass. <laughs> She's going up against, her and Nightwing are going up against Hawkman and Hawkgirl from an alternate reality. But like I said, she may not be able to use her legs, but man, she could still kick some fucking ass. This was awesome. Really good. Was it perfect? Hell no. But just good stuff all around. Bit of a cheesy ending, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was cheesy. But I let it slide. Usually I don't like cheesy endings that much, but it's Gail Simone, it's Nightwing, it's Oracle. I'll let it go. It was it was good. This was good. I give it a four. That's just me. Convergence the question number two. This was fun shit. This was really good. It was good to see Renee Montoya and Batwoman interacting with each other. And the right person was writing it, Greg Rucka. Greg Rucka was the guy that got me back into Batwoman when they were bringing her character up in the prior 52, in the prior DC universe. Greg Rucka, Greg Rucka was the guy that got me into Batwoman when J.H. Williams III was doing the artwork. Those two guys got me into the character. And it was good to see him writing the character again. And I love, I love the 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 the, the insinuation that the, the you know the, the just flat out assumption that from Batwoman that Renee is sleeping with Huntress when it's obviously not the case. But who it really shines in here was was Harvey Dent was Two Face. Just really good. This was a fun read. This was good. Kind of dark, kind of gritty a little bit, but it works for these kinds of characters. And I just had a blast with it. I give it a 3.5. Convergence Speed Force number two. It was great seeing Wally West. It was great seeing my Wally West again. Now, remember, this takes place before Iris, his daughter, Wally's daughter Iris, became the new, became Impulse. This takes place before that happened because I remember when her and her and her brother Jay were tethered to the Speed Force through Wally, there was a point in time where Iris actually took the powers from Jay and Jay gave them up to her and she ended up becoming Impulse. So this is take place before that happened. And in here, he's taking on Flashpoint Wonder Woman and her Amazonian army. And he's getting help from a speedster turtle. Yes, I just fucking said that. He's getting help from a speedster turtle. And it was good to see Wally trying to be the clear, the, the voice of reason in here, but he still knew when he had to put up his dukes and fight. Um, but fighting, fighting with Diana the way he did, and the shit that... Oh, the best moment of the issue for me was when Diana got him in the lasso, and he told the truth. Ooh, 
Ooh, Diana's gonna need some aloe vera for that goddamn burn. But this fight also did something else for Wally. It brought him even closer together with his children because his kids helped him actually win the day. Really good. I really enjoyed this. It was good to see Wally, Jay, and Iris again. Just all around good shit. I give it a 3.5. Convergence Titans. The Titans, number two. This was great. This was great. However, the, the way... Uh, minor spoiler here. Roy Harper Arsenal, he gets his daughter back. He gets Liam back. And I'm like, eh, that's a bit... Eh. I guess that was, that, was a moment, that was supposed to be a moment meant to be emotionally gripping. Like, oh, he got his daughter back. And I'm like, eh, DC brings people back all the time. It doesn't really feel so special anymore sometimes. It doesn't really feel as special as it should sometimes when they do this. Uh... But it was nice that issue one ended with a cliffhanger of him possibly betraying his friends to get his daughter back. But at the beginning of this issue, we show that he's not hes not that stupid. He's not going to just blindly betray his friends for a simple chance at getting his daughter back. Because you're dealing with a fucking villain. Do you really trust their word? Even if he were to betray Donna and Corey... Even if he were to betray them for the chance at getting Liam back, do you really actually believe for a hundred percent that the villain would have stayed true to his word and given Liam back to him? Please. And I love the fact that Roy didn't take that chance. He didn't go there and become totally gullible for it. I, it's a, that was a really shining moment when it comes to character development. He would do anything he possibly could to get his daughter back as long as he knew for a fact he had a chance at getting her back. A true 100% chance. Because he knew, he knew if he were to go along with it, he had a much higher chance of getting screwed over. He knew that. And he didn't let that phase him and that was great stuff this was a great read I really enjoyed it I give this I give it a 3.5 as well we're gonna end this review with my pick of the week folks the Wonder Woman 77 special this was my pick of the week you guys and look who writes it Mark and Draco Mark, I fucking hate Batwoman and Draco. Yeah, Mark and Draco, you're still a piece of shit for what you did to Batwoman. But, you did a fantastic job with this book. You see, I can be brutally honest, yet I can pay compliments, I can criticize and praise at the same time. Who to thunk it? In this book, this book was magnificent. This was outstanding. You have a true testament to the classic Wonder Woman television series featuring Linda Carter. You have incredible writing that fits the time period of where this takes place. You have outstanding artwork that I think should be used in some of the DC's main titles. <coughs> Excuse me. But this really felt like a great episode to the Wonder Woman TV series. This was fantastic. The first story with the with Diana and Steve going undercover to Studio 52. Eh, eh. <laughs> a, a mock of Studio 54 when Disco was at its highest. That story alone was good, but then we got to the second story where Diana comes face to face with, spoiler, she comes face to face with Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman that was played by Kathy Lee Crosby. Holy shit, what a fucking obscure reference and 
wouldn't you know it, I loved it. Magnificent book. Was this worth $8? Damn right it was. I loved it. Thank you, DC. Thank you, Mr. Andrako, for this book. This was outstanding. Was it perfect? Not quite, but damn close. I had a blast reading this, and this will be a treasured item in my collection. This was great. I loved it. A 4.5. That's all I got for this review, everybody. Please follow me anywhere you want to. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest. Check out my bros channels, Mount Vernon Kid. Jennifer and I do Arkham Asylum Studio. Go to my Blue Goblin X channel and look at my review for TMNT number 45. You're going to want to hear what I have to say about that. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I am Groot. I'll see y'all later.